let's uh, let's look at God's word then before we worship the Lord. Can we go to Psalm 18? Psalm 18 and verse 17. Psalm 18 and verse 17. I'll just read a, a few verses. This very well-known psalm, Psalm of David, repeated actually in the Bible, this psalm. David's uh, giving thanks to God. He said, he rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes, who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he has delighted in me. You know, during lockdown, I've been writing a book. I've almost finished it uh, on the garden. And, and the Garden of Eden is, is the word Eden means delight. It says that he rescued me. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Do you know God created you because he delights in you? There's no other reason. It wasn't as though he was in heaven thinking, hmm, what shall I make that will cause me a boatload of trouble? What shall I create that will just be a pain in the neck for 6,000 years? No, let's create people. No, he created us because he delights in us. That's what Eden means. He created a place of delight. He brought me into a spacious place. God has brought you here today because he delights in you. And he wants to rescue you. From what? Well, we're going to look at that this morning. But you're here because God wants you here. You're here because God brings you into a place where he can take his delight in you. Yeah? That's why we have children. Because we want to delight in the joy of having children. And then when they get to teenagers, we change our mind. But for that, that first few years, it's a delight, isn't it? Till they hit 13, it's a delight. And we're here in a spacious place because God brought us here because he delights in us. He delights to rescue us and to bring us into a special place. So that's why we're here this morning. Obviously, we're very limited, although he's brought us into a very nice place. We're very limited. What we can do, we, we can't sing because of the social distancing. We don't want to spread any germs. But we are going to use music uh, to help us to focus on the Lord. So let's all stand in the presence of God. Once again, we're just going to use a couple of songs to help us focus. I know it's so hard and difficult not to sing because we love to give praise to God. But God wants worship in spirit and truth. And as long as our spirit is released and we can quietly say the words and give thanks to God, uh, if we do it quietly, as long as we're not vocalizing or, or breathing out heavily, we can worship the Lord. So let's focus on him now, even before the music starts. Just, just give yourself to the Lord. Father, thank you that you brought us into a, a special place because you delight in us. You brought us to a place where we can together acknowledge that you are our God. You are our Lord, our King, our Savior, the one we worship, the one we delight in, the one we love to give our thanks and praise to. And Lord, we thank you once again that you rescued us from all, all that was against us. And that you bring us, Lord, continually to yourself because you delight in us. So, Lord, though we don't understand the depth of your love and we can't fathom its greatness and the abundance of your grace, nevertheless, we believe it and we receive it through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, Lord, as we listen to these songs of praise, we now focus our attention on giving you our love and our worship for your glory in Jesus' name. Come on, as we hear these songs, let's focus on the Lord and worship the Lord. Amen. I call out to you and worship. I call out to you with praise. For you to me with grace 
Keep focused on the Lord, worshiping Him. You know, for years we've been constantly saying this thing over and over again. Worship is not singing songs. You can include that. But actually in the Bible, worship is primarily about what you do with your body. When Jesus gave thanks, it says he would look up to heaven. When people worship Jesus, they, they didn't sing a song. They would come and kneel at his feet. Apostle Paul said he wants everyone to lift up holy hands. We love singing and giving praise to the Lord, but our worship is much more than that. It doesn't even have to have music. Worship is giving our bodies as a spiritual sacrifice to God. This is our reasonable worship. You just give your body now in recognition to God. I want to lift up your head and give thanks. And I want to lift up holy hands. And I want to stand in awe of God. And I want to kneel and worship the Lord. For it's your body. Don't ever make, let your body tell you what you can and cannot do. The spirit within you flows through you. So your body is given in worship to God. Hallelujah. Father, we stand today in recognition that you are the creator God, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Lord and our Savior. He died for our sins, Lord. He rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. And is glorified at your right hand. And Father, you have sent your Holy Spirit to us. Who flows through us and fills us. With all your love and grace and peace. So that we can worship you today. Lord, thank you that you brought us into a spacious place place where we can delight in you and you can delight in us and so Lord this day once again we acknowledge you are our God and we worship you and to that Lord we say amen 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 just give a wave to someone Say hello really quietly. Hello. We're slowly upping it a little bit each week. Soon we'll be hugging each other and kissing each other. And it's terrible, isn't it? It's better, it's better the way it is now. We'll be having tea and coffee together. This is not forever. Just temporary hygiene measures. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats. So obviously our meetings are shorter than normal, but we're still worshipping the Lord. We're still listening to the word of God. Let's go to God's word right now. Luke chapter 1 verse 74. Gospel of Luke chapter 1 verse 74. We looked at this last week. Gospel of Luke chapter 1 verse 74. So although it's a lot quieter than all, we can't sing. It doesn't mean you have to be miserable. Sometimes quietness, can, it can make you sort of lethargic and apathetic or even, you know, just reserved and quiet. You can still smile at me. Please, smile at me. Seventy <laughs> percent 70 of you just did not change your expression at all. They just went, well, smile as you think he is. Come to church, I'm not going to be happy. So last week, we actually looked at this, and so I want us to 
just expound a little bit more upon this. We looked at God's oath, how it says God promised on oath. And verse 74, God's oath was to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and uh, to enable us to serve him without fear. So this, um, this was a recognition of who God is and what God is doing. And uh, here we have a declaration that this is what God is going to do. And it's, it's just the, those, uh, the first half of the sentence. God's oath was to rescue us from the hand of our enemies. Yeah? So the first thing that, uh, that the priest here recognizes is that God's promised to rescue you. God's promised to rescue you. Amen. Come on, we're getting back to normal. Now, do you need rescuing? You see, if you don't think you need rescuing, then that's no big deal, is it? You know, a drowning man, if he doesn't know he's drowning, isn't going to let someone rescue him, is he? You would think he would know, but surprisingly, there's a, there's a lot of people in this world don't think they need rescuing. They think they're there to rescue other people. To rescue us from the hand of our enemies. If you don't think you've got any enemies, you don't think you need rescuing. But God says very clearly that his plan is to rescue us. What is he going to rescue you from? From your enemies. Who are they? Anyone got any enemies? Winston Churchill once says, do you have enemies? Good. That means you actually believe in something. Because if you just go along with anything, you'll never have any enemies. But if you actually take a stand for something that you believe is right, there's going to be some people that will become your enemy. I've got loads of enemies. Not, you know, a lot of people who would say they're my enemies. It's not because I've done something to them. It's just that they don't like what I stand for. So God says he's going to rescue us from our enemies. This word rescue, uh, ryoma in Greek, it, it actually only occurs 16 times in the New Testament, this word. Uh, so let's just look at, look at that this morning. God wants to rescue us. What does he want to rescue you from? Because he clearly wants to rescue us, but we need to know what we need to be rescued from. Yeah? So this word that's it's actually translated, in, it, sometimes it's translated deliver us from, but in the NIV it's 16 times. It, 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 it's translated rescue us. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26. What does God want to rescue you from? The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So God wants to rescue us from our enemies. So the final enemy is death. Does anyone like death? The Bible talks about death, actually, in a personification, as though it's a, a real spiritual entity, right? You've got an enemy called death who wants to kill everything of God in your life. It actually wants to kill you. It's the final enemy. It's the, it's the one thing that's, that threatens you and scares you and says he's coming to get you. God says he wants to deliver us from this enemy, to rescue us from death. So let's start with the best news of all. Jesus has rescued you from death. And he proved that by dying and defeating death and rising again. That's why the resurrection is the most important aspect of Jesus' ministry. Without the resurrection, all his teaching falls to the ground. Because Jesus came to rescue you from death. That's why throughout his ministry, when he continually said, he who believes in me will never die, he who, he who dies will yet live if they believe in me, because Jesus knew he was going to rescue us from death. You can't get any better than that. If you knew today that 100% death was totally defeated in your life, in every realm, all your troubles would disappear. If you didn't have any food, you wouldn't be bothered because you can't die. 
If you didn't have any money, it wouldn't concern you because money just means you might not have resources to keep you alive. But if, if you understand Jesus has rescued us from death, that wouldn't concern you. Sickness wouldn't concern you because death has been defeated. So the, the thing about sickness is it can make you weaker and weaker and make you sick until death itself comes. Jesus has destroyed death. He has rescued us from death. Amen? Smile. Jesus is alive. That's why the, the preaching of the gospel, that is primarily what it is. Jesus is alive. And a lot of people think, well, what does that even mean? It means death has been defeated. You have been rescued from death. He will not leave you in death. He will take you through it and out the other side, yeah? And so this concept of being rescued is probably the single most important theme throughout the Bible in many respects. In the Old Testament, this word's mentioned many times in the, in the Hebrew form. And when you read the story, God will always say in the Old Testament, I am the Lord who rescued you from the Egyptians, who rescued you from the land of bondage, who rescued you. And God keeps reminding everybody, I'm the God who rescues you. Do we want to be rescued? God rescued them from Egypt when he sent Moses. God rescued them from the hand of the Philistines when he sent David. God rescued them from the famine when he sent Joseph. You see, God will always send someone to rescue them, to rescue his people. Look at Acts 7, verse 25. Acts chapter 7, verse 25. Do you want to be rescued? Not bothered. Quite like drowning. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. When I uh, worked at the council, they once sent me a birthday card, uh, thinking this was really funny because they always like to have a go at me being a Christian. And it, it, on the birthday card, it was a picture of um, a man drowning at sea. And he called out and said, God, uh, please come and rescue me. I'm going to put my faith totally in God to come and rescue me from drowning in the sea. And at that moment, a helicopter came, lowered the winch down to rescue him. Says, we're here, we've come to rescue you. And the man says, no, it doesn't matter, I'm trusting God. I don't need you to rescue me, I'm going to trust God to rescue me, so go away. So the helicopter flew away. I mean, the card wasn't this long, I'm, I'm extrapolating. And then a boat turned up, the Coast Guard, and said, we've seen you drowning in the sea, we've come to rescue you. And the man said, it doesn't matter, I don't need your help, I'm trusting God. I've prayed to God, I have faith in God, and I know God is going to rescue me, and so I'm not getting on your boat, I'm going to trust God to rescue me. So the boat sailed off. And then a shark came and ate him. And he got to heaven. And he said to the Lord, why didn't you rescue me? I put my faith in you. And the punchline, which is obviously obvious, God said, I sent a helicopter and I sent a boat. And you didn't, you didn't accept either of them. And you see, as Christians, we can be just the same. God sends Moses to rescue his own people, thinking they would recognize that God is sending him to rescue them, but they didn't. They wanted God to rescue them, but not through Moses. And very often, what we want is, we want God to rescue us from our situation, but we don't want to do it in the way God does it. And so we continue suffering in our situation, reject the thing, often a person who God sends to us, and, and we reject him, right? The Jews are still looking for Messiah to come. Guess what? He came 2,000 years ago. Yeah, but they didn't want that kind of Messiah. They wanted a Messiah who would physically kill the Romans and, and wage physical war and kill everybody so the Jews could have their own nation again. But actually, God sent someone who was much better than that. He wouldn't just rescue them from from temporary government oppression, he was actually going to save them from their sins and rescue them from death. 
If only they could see what God was doing. What is God doing in your life? God will send people to rescue you. Children. Anyone here under 40? Because I don't class anyone as mature until they've got to 40. keeps going up as I get older. Because, you know, you think you know what you're doing until you get older, you realize you don't. You know, I still look around sometimes for an adult to help me. Then realize they're looking at me. God sends your mum and dad to help you. Oh, I'm not listening to them. <laughs> Probably not going to get much more wisdom from anybody else. Now, I know there are bad mum and dads, but generally speaking, your mum and dad will have your best. Are you listening, teenagers? Ooh, I can do it on my own. You can't, you'll drown. You can't do anything on your own. None of us can. He sends your mum and dad. He sends teachers. He sends people. He sends pastors and leaders and advisors and wise people. Don't try and be so spiritual that you think, I'm just going to let God rescue me. No, he's going to use somebody else. Unless you think you're part of the Trinity and somehow you don't need. God sends angels. He get, no, I, I, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit and me. Well, actually, no. It's the Trinity, not the Quadrinity. God wants to rescue you, but you have to understand the situation we are in in this world. We need each other. God sends people to help us. That doesn't mean everyone's help. We're going to look at that, that in a moment. But God wants to rescue us, and he will rescue you primarily through speaking through other people. Obviously, he saves you through faith in Christ. We're not Suggesting otherwise, but we've got to get this concept of how God wants to rescue us. That's why the church is so important. Because you can't be rescued by not being a part of God's church. Because God's only saving his church. It's like in the time of Noah's Ark, you know. I mean, I would love to go back to the time of Noah and, and just interview people. I say, why didn't you get in the ark? And I'm pretty sure, I mean, there would have been mockers and people ridiculing and making fun of Noah. But I don't think everyone did that. I think a lot of them would have just said, well, Noah's got his own way of being saved. I've got my way. What, to swim in the sea for a year? It's not a very good way to rescue yourself. I'm building a raft. It's going to rain for 40 days and it's going to flood for a year and the, the sharks don't die in the flood. Have you noticed that? It's not a good rescue plan. Why don't you get on the boat? Well, it's okay. I've got my own way of being saved. There isn't another way of being saved. There's only God's way. I'd listen to Noah and I'd get on the boat. Oh, I don't like giraffes. Well, giraffes might not like you. at Romans 7 verse 23. Now, this is one that we don't like to acknowledge in God's rescue plan. It's not just that God's saving us from death and from our enemies and obviously evil things. This is the one that we don't like to acknowledge. Now this is the Apostle Paul. And here he's saying, he sees, I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You see, Paul, having already explained how you saved from death, now opens up another can of worms. He says, actually, I need rescuing from myself. Because there is a law of sin at work within me that is continually contradicting what God's law is. God's law is the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. God gives us life in Jesus Christ. But do you know you've got the law of you inside you? You've got your opinions. You've got what you think. You've got what the Bible calls your carnal nature, your flesh, your sinful nature. Do you know you need rescuing from that? 
Sometimes I hear, you know, people say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I know what I think and I've got my own opinions. Well, stop it. Let's agree with what Jesus is saying and doing. Well, that's what you think. No, that's what Jesus thinks. And we cannot underestimate this. What a wretched man I am, Paul says. Have you ever noticed the language the apostles used of themselves? We, we don't use of ourselves. I mean, they said they were useless and hopeless. They were weak. They had no abilities. They, they, they said they were wretched. Uh, we think we're all right, don't we? Well, we're not that bad, are we? Yes, we are. Your ability to commit sin is just as real within you now as it has ever been. No matter how much you believe in Jesus, given the right situation and the right circumstances, you are capable of being wicked. That sinful nature is not gone yet. It's still operating within you. That, that, that nature of sin and death, that, that ability to, to think wickedness, to lust, to want, to desire, to crave, to covet, it's still there. It's just now Jesus has brought the new law in you, which is going to conquer that and rescue you from that. But that only happens through faith, through the cross and the Holy Spirit working in your life. Without that, you'll end up doing anything. You're capable of anything. I'm amazed at some of the evil things I think. I don't know how you, if, whether you think I'm holy or not, but in Christ I am, but in Dave I'm not. Thank God I'm in Christ and not in Dave. Dear me, you won't want, you won't want Dave in Dave. He don't even like himself, never mind you. And you're the same. But God has rescued us from that. Look at the next verse. Who will rescue me from this body? It's not despairing. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. In my sinful nature that's what it will do. But I'm not in that. I'm in Christ. And Christ has rescued me from that. If you want to be rescued. You see, I once heard a, a lifeguard uh, talking about how to save someone from drowning. And this is what he said. He says, wait until they realize they're sinking. Don't try and rescue them while they still think they can thrash about and keep themselves afloat. Because all they will do is drag you under as you try and help them. You have to wait till they give up trying to save themselves. Then you can rescue them. Because they'll let you do it. But whilst ever they're still thrashing around, whilst ever they're still trying to keep themselves afloat, if you swim and try and help them, they'll grab you and just pull you under. You've got to get them to realize in their innermost being that I cannot do this. And it's the same with God. You've got to realize you cannot save yourself. You can't rescue yourself. Jesus will rescue you from death, yes. From sin, yes. But from yourself. Don't try and save yourself from yourself. You can't. You'll just go into some kind of mental psychosis of trying to psychoanalyze everything you're doing and thinking, and you'll not even be aware of your own consciousness. You'll not know what it is. Trust the Spirit of God in Christ Jesus. He delivers you from it, and His power flows through you so that flesh is crucified in Christ. Acts 26 Verse 17. What else does God rescue us from? Acts 26 and verse 17. He is Paul serving God. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending them to you. Now, when God ever sends you on a ministry or any mission or, or, or God's using you, you will have to acknowledge this. People will fight against you. Now, the sad thing is, here, God says, I will rescue you from your own people. Sometimes the people who will turn against you the most are the people who you thought would love you the most. Jesus said that the, the, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. 
Do not think I have come to bring peace. I have come to bring a sword. There, there will be division in families because of the truth I'm going to speak. And sometimes one of the hardest things we have to realize is we have to be rescued from those that we thought we could trust. I will rescue you from your own people. Who hurt Jesus the most? His, his outside enemies? No. Actually, when you read it, they couldn't touch him. It was his own disciples. It was his own family. It says even his own brethren didn't believe in him. It was people like Judas. Even, even the good apostles often failed him and denied him. And if you don't understand that God will rescue you even from that, you will become very disillusioned and bitter. Because you will find that people will let you down and even fight against you. And you'll think, how can I hurt the per how can I help the person when the person I'm trying to help is trying to fight against me? I mean, I admire surgeons who operate on people, but I, I don't think they'd ever operate on someone unless they put them under anesthetic first. Because if you tried to cut someone open and take out their appendix and they, were, they weren't asleep, they would start punching you in the face. They're not going to let you do the necessary work to help them while they're still awake. And sometimes, you know, the Bible says the word of God is a sharp sword. And sometimes just telling people about Jesus creates such a reaction in them that they hate you for it. God says, I'm going to rescue you even from your own people. Even the people you're trying to help who turn against you and then blame you and then stab you in the back and then betray you. And you think, all I tried to do was help my own people. Well, God will rescue you from that as well. And he did. He rescued Paul and from the Gentiles. He knew the Gentiles would hate him. But he rescued it, Paul from his own people as well. God will rescue you when you've been hurt by those you thought you could trust. Listen, this is very important. Because one of the main reasons why people stop coming to church is because they, they've been hurt or they think they've been hurt. Sometimes it's not even real, but it is in their heart by someone in church. No, God will rescue you from that. Don't disconnect from the rescue plan. You know, I, I, I've only once been in an ambulance when I fractured my skull, split my head open as a child. And the, the ambulance came to school and took me to hospital and stitched up my head. You know, I didn't quiz the ambulance driver on whether I liked him or not. You know, the nurse or the doctor who stitched up my head some of you are looking at me now, and that's why he's gone a bit weird. He, he's fractured his skull. Yeah, I was a child. Still got the scar, you can see it. You know, if someone's genuinely rescuing, you don't say, hold on, before I get in this ambulance, let me talk to the driver. I don't know whether I like him or not. Just get in the ambulance. doesn't matter whether you like him or not. He's taking you to hospital. Let's submit to God's rescue plan. Look at G Galatians. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4. Talking about Jesus, obviously. Jesus is the rescuer who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. Now, this is just as important in the Bible as being rescued from everything else. In fact, I've heard some people say that salvation is just as much, if not more, talking about saving you out of the system of the world as much as talking about saving you from your sins. This is something that modern Christians don't even seem to grasp. Jesus didn't just save you from your sins and death and yourself. He's saving you from this present evil age. The world and its systems are very clearly taught in the Bible that they are evil. They are, they are an enemy of God. Anyone who loves the world, the Bible says, is an enemy of God. You cannot love the world and love God. Because this present system is an enemy of God, but God is saving you out of the world. But too many Christians actually love the world. Now, we're not talking about people. That's not what the world means. 
it means the systems and the philosophies and the politics and, and the rules and the regulations and the ideologies and the religions and everything in this world, Jesus is saving us out of that and taking us to his kingdom. If you find you love the world so much, I mean, you find some Christians don't even want to come to church because they love the world more than the church. Well, that proves you're not submitting to the rescue plan. Because Jesus is saving you from the world and its pleasures and its idolatries and its luxuries and its entertainments and everything. And so many Christians are always having these arguments about, well, can I do that? Is it right? It's not about whether you can or can't do it. It's about whether God is saving you from this world or whether you'd rather be in the world. Because God can't save you from the world if you love the world as much as you'd love everything else. He's saving us from this present evil age. The answer can never be ultimately in politics. We pray for our politicians, but human politics will not rescue us. It can't be in philosophy and ideology and, and all these things because ultimately it's only Jesus that can rescue us from these things. This is so clear in the teaching of Jesus and the New Testament, the Bible as a whole. He is saving us out of that. You see, we feel trapped. A genuine Christian feels trapped in this world. You feel as though the whole system is anti-Christ. It's always against God. The media... TV, the programs, it's always against God. Yes, it is. Stop looking for it to not be against God because this present evil age is something that God is rescuing us from. Just because occasionally it might not be that bad and occasionally they do this acknowledge God or occasionally acknowledge Jesus, don't think that this present age isn't evil. It is. But Jesus is rescuing us from that. He's implementing his kingdom, which is totally different from the systems of this world. Totally different. Operates on a totally different paradigm. Colossians 1 verse 13. Book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. This world is just full of darkness. God rescues us by taking us out of darkness into his glorious light. If you love Jesus, if you love darkness, you're doomed. He says, I want you to come out of the darkness into the light. Because that's what he's rescuing you from. A Christian who loves darkness is going against God's rescue plan. So God is the rescuer. He's rescuing us from these things. Another thing God is rescuing us from. 1 Thessalonians, 1 <clears throat> Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. What else is God rescuing you from? So we're waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us <clears throat> from the coming wrath. God is bringing judgment on the world. God is going to, at some point, unleash his anger on everything that is sinful. The things that he's rescuing us from. The world, the flesh, the devil, evil, sin, death. God is going to destroy it all. And Jesus is rescuing us, not just from all those things, but from the wrath itself. God is rescuing you out of his judgment. So his wrath and judgment is not going to come upon you. Jesus took the wrath so that we could be delivered from it. The wrath, we have no idea how angry God is about evil. I mean, you just think how angry you are when you see a child abused. Or just think how angry, you are. well, just multiply that by infinity. That's how angry God is. And God is going to kill all that. Sin, evil, the devil. He's going to throw death into the lake of fire. He's going to destroy it all. The evil systems of this world that oppress and kill people and persecute people and behead people. All this evil, God hates it and is going to destroy it. 
The only reason he hasn't done that yet is because he's still rescuing people. But the point comes where he has to bring that judgment. But he's going to rescue you from that judgment so that he doesn't pour his judgment and wrath on those who want to be rescued from it. He can't rescue someone who wants it or who is attached to it. And God gives us, Jesus gave us two examples actually about the time when this judgment would come. He said it would be as in the days of Noah and it would be as in the days of Lot when Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he just looked at Noah, that judgment was coming. What was people's attitude towards it? Were they going to submit to God's rescue plan? Most people weren't. And then the other example that he gave us uh, look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. The other example the Bible gives several times, Jesus emphasized this very clearly. You remember the story of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah? He was trying to live a righteous life and everyone was banging on his door, trying to impose their ideas of, well, everything upon him. If he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless for that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. So God says he's going to rescue you like he rescued Lot. Now, if you know the story of Lot in Genesis... When they came banging on Lot's door, the, the townsfolk of Sodom, trying to impose their immorality on him, saying they, he had to accept their ideas of sexual behavior, there was two angels came to rescue Lot. Now, he didn't know they were angels. Verse 9, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Let me tell you something. God knows how to rescue you. Do, do you know that? That doesn't mean you know how he's going to rescue you. Lot didn't even know the angels were angels. Never mind what they were trying to do. If you read the story, they're saying, come on, we're taking you out of here. And he was like, what on earth are you talking about? Where are we going? What time is it? What do I wear? I think that's why his wife looked back. I think she changed her mind about what clothes to put on. Well, I can't be rescued in my nighty. They didn't, they didn't know what was going on. God sent two angels to rescue him, and he was arguing with the angels about, well, where are we going? What's happening? What do you mean everything's going to be destroyed tonight? What do you mean? And it says the angels had to grab him by the hand and pull him out. You see, Lot was just like us. He demands to know what the rescue plan is. It's amazing when, you, when God tells somebody something, and I, I've seen this you know, over and over again, instead of believing what God says, they demand an explanation as to how God's going to do it. Let me tell you something. He isn't going to. And it is not fair of you to ask him to. You know, when I take my phone fixing, I just give it to the guy and say, fix my phone. When I take my car in, I just take it and fix the car. Well, let me tell you what's wrong with it. I don't care what's wrong with it. I just want it back, but it, I just want it back working. You're the expert. You fix it. When God's going to rescue you, he can't explain everything he's going to do. And if he did it, it'd scare you to death anyway. You know, when he took them out of Egypt... He didn't say, by the way, what we're going to do is, you know that big sea? We're going to walk through that. It's like, well, I'm not coming then. I'm staying here. God's rescue plan will not make sense to you unless you put your hand in his hand and allow him to rescue you. You've got to understand that. You, what, this is not the A-team. Did you used to watch the A-team? When they say, I love it when a plan comes together. They didn't have a plan. Never made any sense. I mean, anyone over 40 know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Here are the 18. They say, what's our plan? Oh, well, we'll get shut up in this house and an army will surround us. But don't worry, we've got a staple of two magnets and a, a bunch of paper clips and I'm going to make an atomic weapon out of it and we're going to destroy the army. It's like, that's the stupidest plan I've ever heard in my life. 
but they had Mr. T, so they were okay, because he'd just <laughs> run out and beat them all up. Trust God's rescue plan. It won't make sense to you, but he's rescuing you from the trials and from punishment and from the judgment that's going to come. But you've got to submit to that. If you're going to not trust in the Lord with all your heart, but lean on your own understanding, God's never going to rescue you because you're never going to submit to it because you don't understand what he's doing. You'll never understand what God's doing. You don't even know how long you're going to be alive on this planet. So how long do you know the rescue plan is, is set for? You know, one of the most frustrating things about this coronavirus lockdown is I had all my year planned. I spent a whole month planning which countries, you know, I, I strategically planned them throughout the year so I'm not away too much. You know, and I was in Africa, America. I've been invited to Singapore. I was, I, was, I was planning all these trips. I had guest speakers in every month, all planned. It was an amazing plan. <laughs> and all the time I'm thinking, I, I, and I was telling people, I don't know. I, I just feel something weird about this year. And I, I said it when I was booked in a couple of conferences in America. And I said to Caroline, I just don't feel that... I, I just, I, there's nothing in my heart that's clicking with it. I'll go because they've asked me to go and God told me to connect with... You know, I just don't... I, I'll just carry on making my plans. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> and I can stand now and look at that chart and think, wow, not one <laughs> single thing I planned... <laughs> has happened. But God's rescue plan is flowing. I know, if you'd have told me that, 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 that as of, is this today, as Joseph can correct me, or tomorrow, by tomorrow, there will be over 500,000, half a million views of our, on our YouTube channel. Half a million. I think, I, I can't get that number in my head. If you'd have told me I was reaching half a million people with our church and our, our songs and our teaching, it's like, wow, God's plan was much better than mine. I, in my court, I'd have just been preaching to a few thousand. God's rescue plan is much bigger and better than ours. We just have to submit to that. Okay, then, let's move quickly through these last two or three then. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 18. 2 Timothy 4, verse 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom to be glory, to him be glory forever and ever. This is Paul writing right at the end of his ministry, his final epistle to Timothy, the, the pass through takeover, a lot of Paul's ministry after him. So he's looking at the end and he says, God's rescued me from every evil attack. And I mean, Paul had had some... I mean, they, people were trying to kill Paul every day. But he says, God rescued me from every evil attack. Look at verse 17. Just go back one verse. Verse 17. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it and I was delivered. That's actually the same. That's the same word as, as uh, this word, rescued, Ryome. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. They were going to throw him to the lions and God rescued him from that. But at the end of his life, God says, I'm going to take you home now, Paul. He'd, he'd run his race. He'd completed. He'd recognized that God had delivered him. Now look at verse 18. Does it remind you of something? The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I remind you of something. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Deliver me from evil. If you notice, Paul is sort of summarizing the last couple of verses of the, the Lord's prayer there. using the same key words, the kingdom, the power, the glory, protecting me, re delivering me, rescuing me from evil. Why did Jesus tell us that when we are praying, we are to say, deliver us from evil? Because it's the same word as rescue. 
by your man. He will rescue you from evil. Jesus says, say that every day. Whenever you pray, make sure you don't just, you know, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory, but also the Lord will rescue me from evil. Lord, deliver us from evil. Why are you to say that? Because otherwise you'll forget and you'll fall into the trap of thinking that God's not going to rescue you. God is always going to rescue you. He's the rescuer. He's the deliverer. From all these things that we see in scriptures, look at how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Let me pull this together. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Now, sometimes it's, this word is translated rescue. Sometimes it's translated deliverer. So here Paul says, the deliverance God is giving us, he has delivered us, he will deliver us, and he will continue to deliver us. Past, present, future rescue. The rescue of God is not just something he did. It's something he's doing right now. And it's something he's always going to do. Don't fall into the trap that God rescued you last time, but this time he's going to let you swim on your own. He's only going to let you swim on your own if you think you can swim on your own. If you think you can do it on your own, God will let you to show you you can't. But you don't lean on your own understanding. God wants to rescue you today. Yeah, but he rescued me last time and I messed it up. Well, you'll mess it up again, but he still wants to rescue you. Don't be like Peter. Oh, I won't deny you. Yes, you will. Trust in the Lord, not your own strength. He wants to rescue you today and you'll need rescuing tomorrow as well. From what? From yourself, from evil, from the world, from all these things. You'll still need rescuing tomorrow because you'll still find all these things are surrounding you and going through your mind and in your heart tomorrow. You will move from faith to faith. From glory to glory, you'll always need to rely on God. His grace and His glory is going to flow throughout all eternity. The angels in heaven still need God. And we will always need Him and we'll want to rely upon Him. Even when He's dealt with death and sin, He's going to save us. If you think of someone in the Titanic, you know, imagine you're on the Titanic sinking and someone grabs you and throws you overboard. You've been saved from a sinking ship. Yeah, but you're in the water. So you still need saving, don't you? You've not sunk with the ship, but you're still in the water. So a lifeboat comes and says, I want to save you. What do you say? No, I've been saved. I'm not on the Titanic anymore. Yeah, but you're still in the water. So you need saving out of the water into the lifeboat. So they pull you into the lifeboat. So now you're saved. No, you're not. You're freezing cold in a lifeboat in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Northern Atlantic, you're still going to die. You still now need another ship to come and save you out of the lifeboat. Can you see? You need saving, 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 saving. Right? You need saving from the world, from your sins, from your death, from yourself, from everything around you. You're always going to need saving to the next level of being rescued. That's why I'm, I'm very cautious when people only talk about being saved in a past tense because it's, it's past, present, and continuous. Jesus saved you. He's saving you. He'll always save you if we submit to him. Romans eleven twenty six, and then we'll come to the Lord and have an application. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer, the rescuer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away the sins. I love this. Because Jesus is called the rescuer, the deliverer. Jesus is the one who rescues you. Now, we know that anyway. He's going to come, and this is his covenant with them, when he takes away their sins. Let me say this. Jesus is the only one who can rescue you. There's no one else. There's people who can help you. There's people who can throw you a, you know, a life jacket, there's people who can throw you one of those rubber rings. But there's only Jesus can rescue you. There's only Jesus that is the deliverer. And we know this 
because that's his name. Yahshua. Jesus is the one who comes to save us from our sins. But do you know how he did that? You see, when he died on the cross, and you read this in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 27, do you know what they said to Jesus on the cross? He rescued others, but he couldn't rescue himself. And they said, leave him on the cross. Let's see if God comes to rescue him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let's see if God rescues Jesus. Well, he didn't rescue him from the cross because that's why he came. He came to rescue you by dying in your place. He came to rescue you by taking your sins, by taking your sins in his own body so that you can be saved from your own body, from your own flesh. Jesus took it in himself. The wrath of God was put on Jesus at the cross. That's why Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was cut off from all the goodness of God for that moment, even though he was God. You see, he came to rescue you by not rescuing himself. He sacrificed his life for us. But because of his sinful, right, uh, sinless righteousness, his holiness, the grave and death could not hold him. So the power of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Christ's own holiness, rescued him from death because it couldn't touch him. And ultimately, it cannot touch you either if you allow him to rescue you. He wasn't rescued from the cross so that you would be. He wasn't rescued from sin and death so that you will be. He wasn't rescued from all that judgment and from the world and from his enemies so that you will be. He's the one who rescues us. Let's bow our heads. Lee, can you just come, please? Just focus on the Lord. We can't take communion together, but we can focus on the Lord. Jesus is the rescuer, the deliverer. He's the one who comes to you, who came to you, who is coming to you. He's the one who has saved you from your sins, rescued you from sin, rescued you from the devil, rescued you from death. He's the one who's done all this. That's the key concept. You know, even a good Hollywood movie has a bit, in, uh, somewhere in the movie there'll be a rescue because we know in our hearts that's what we need. We need rescuing. We need rescuing from ourselves, from our sins. We need rescuing from what other people have done to us. We need rescuing from this world and this present evil age. We're going to be rescued from the wrath that's going to come, the judgment. He is rescuing us. He has rescued us. He will rescue us past, present, and future. He delivers us from the evil one. He rescues us from evil. He keeps us from it. He doesn't lead us into temptation. He is the rescuer. What are you going to do today? Are you saved? Do you believe in the Lord? Praise the Lord for that. But there might still be other things in your life that you're worried and scared about. Maybe even things in your own thought life and your own body, even your own actions and attitudes, the sins that you're getting entangled in. This world, this evil age, you're scared to go out, scared of what people are saying to you and doing to you. Jesus rescues you from all those things. There is no need to fear. What's your response to the deliverer? What's your response to the one who's rescued you from hell, from sin, from the devil, from everything? In the Gospels, it says, He has rescued us from all our troubles. An all encompassing statement. 
What are your troubles? He's rescued you from those. Paul, at the end of his life, says he rescued me from everything. And now, when Paul was old and the time to go to the Lord, he was Paul, perfectly at peace. Because he knew a God who rescued him from everything. And he will with us. Just submit everything to the Lord right now. Your own thoughts, your own life, your own sins. Even those that have done you wrong, submit them to the Lord. Because you yourself have rejected people who God sent to help you. So submit that, that to the Lord as well. And just thank God for the people he sent into your life. God is rescuing you. You won't understand the plan. But you will know he's the deliverer. If you submit to the Lord. Well, just respond to the Lord right now. We can't sing. But we can make our response in our hearts. Just look to the Lord. Say, yes, thank you, Lord. I submit to your plan, your rescue plan. I'm a drowning man. I can't keep myself afloat. I can't, I can't even get through this week without you, Lord. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to have total faith. In my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just make that decision right now. That's what you're going to do today, tomorrow, all week. You're going to put your hand in the one who rescues you and delivers you. Make that response right now to the Lord. Let's pray to the Lord. Father, thank you that you put into operation the greatest rescue plan this universe has ever seen. 6,000 years ago, Lord, when you said that the deliverer would come. Lord, we can see throughout history he came, he delivered us, he rescued us. He's interceding for us. He's saving us right now. And he's going to take us for all eternity into his kingdom to be with him forevermore. And so, Lord, thank you that you have put that plan into operation. You have executed it and fulfilled it and you have saved us. It's an established fact, Lord, and you are saving us today and forevermore. So, Lord, thank you for every person here, Lord. May they follow you this week and be with the deliverer, the one who keeps us from evil. For it's your kingdom, it's your power, and it's your glory because you are the one who did it. And so we give you all the praise. And all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.